Friends, good morning and welcome to our special Good Friday service of worship. Today we remember that Jesus was crucified. He was pierced for our transgressions. He suffered and died for our sins. We remember the sacrifice of our Lord with gratitude because his death gives us life. It brings redemption to the whole world. This is a different kind of service today, and it'll be different in a few ways. First of all, um, I'm not going to announce the hymns. Just follow along in the bulletin, and you'll see the number, and Karen will begin to play it, and we'll stand and sing for the four hymns. Um, also, at the end of the service, unusually for us, we're such a chatty, friendly congregation, and that's a good thing, but today... Because it's Good Friday, I'd like to ask us when Karen plays the postlude after the blessing has been pronounced, let's just be in silence as we go out of the sanctuary, and then we can greet each other uh, on the steps and downstairs. But just let this, the tone of this morning, help us ponder mystery and the extent of our salvation for what Jesus did. So let's worship our Savior together. Remain seated and let's read together our responsive call to worship. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. We adore you, O Christ. And we bless you. We preach Christ crucified, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. King of glory, we adore you, our Savior and our Lord. You suffered on the cross and gave your life as a ransom for many. We bless and thank you for the outpouring of your love. We offer you our worship today out of unspeakable gratitude. <clears throat> Crucified Jesus, Son of the Father, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, eternal word of God, we worship you. The crucified Jesus, holy temple of God, dwelling place of the Most High, the very gate of heaven, burning flame of love, we worship you. The crucified Jesus, sanctuary of justice and love, full of kindness, source of all faithfulness, we worship you, who crucified Jesus, ruler of every heart. In you are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In you dwells all the fullness of God. We worship you. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Almighty God, look with mercy on all of us today in this church and around the world for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on a cross. Through him who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God forever and ever. scriptures are read and as your word is preached we may hear with joy what you say to us today Amen. the responsive reading today is Psalm 22 it's found on page 552 in your few Bibles or large print 853 Psalm 22 My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Yet you are wholly enthroned on the praises of Israel. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near. There is no one to help. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. My 
mouth is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. O oh my help, come quickly to my aid. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen, you have rescued me. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before him. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. And proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it.
We've been walking our way through big chunks of Mark's Gospel, and today we go to Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 39. It's found on page 54 in your pew Bibles, and 1592 in the large print Bible. Mark chapter 15. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, the darkness covered over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders heard it. They said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And some ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. 
Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. You know, in most biographies, the person's death is mentioned briefly in the last chapter of the book. For example, in David Donald's magnificent biography of Abraham Lincoln, the American president's death merits seven pages out of more than 700. I once read a massive biography of Chairman Mao Zedong, the Chinese leader, 971 pages, it gave a page and a half to Mao's passing. But in the Gospels, the death of Jesus is central. There are 30 chapters in the Gospels that focus on the last week of his life. Nearly half of what is written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John relates to Christ's death one way or another. Why is that? It's because the cross is the hallmark of Christianity. You find it on people's necks as jewelry, on top of church buildings, and on communion tables, on hilltops, in cemeteries. Crosses are a symbol of the Christian faith. Not just a book to remind us of Christ's teaching, but a cross to remind us of his death. Now that in itself is remarkable, isn't it? Since the cross was the cruelest form of capital punishment in the ancient world. I mean, what would you think if people went around today with the pendant of an electric chair hanging around their necks? It's kind of the equivalent. What other group has as its central symbol an instrument of death 
especially when the marks of that society are meant to be love and peace. The cross is a paradox. Someone put it like this, they said, the cross is a picture of violence, yet the key to peace. A picture of suffering, yet the key to healing. A picture of death, yet the key to life. A picture of utter weakness, yet the key to power. A picture of vicious hatred, yet the key to love and mercy and forgiveness. Why is that? Why is the cross the supreme mark of Christianity? Why do Christians make such a big deal about one person, admittedly an important person, dying? Jesus died a martyr's death, making the supreme sacrifice for other people, just like many others have done down through history. But what made Jesus' death special? Friends, what makes Jesus' death special is who he was and is. Christians down through the centuries have believed that, that Jesus was the very presence of God in our midst. That in the life of this particular man, Jesus, God was present in a unique way. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That God himself took on human flesh and made his home among us. That's what makes the death of Jesus so special. The cross helps us to understand what God is really like. A God who's fully entered into our humanity. A God who became flesh and blood, and as Peterson translates it, moved into our neighborhood. A God who became one of us in the person of Jesus. Maybe we're so familiar with this, We've lost the sense of shock that the cross should make us feel. Dorothy Sayers, the English novelist, once remarked how strange it is that people can hear the story of the killing of God told Sunday after Sunday and not experience any shock at all. So today, let's try to understand in a fresh way what the death of Jesus on the cross teaches us about who God is and what God is really like. First, the cross shows us that God cares about us. We've all had times in our lives, I'm sure you have, when it felt like God is far away from you. It may seem that way, but God is closer to us than our own heartbeats. Because in Jesus, God came to our world. God lived a human life and died just as we have to die, although his experience of death was beyond our imagining. The cross teaches us that God cares about us. God isn't some vague, impersonal power out there somewhere who created the world and then left us to get on with it. No, God cares so much that he came down to us. He came near to us. He laid down his own life for us. In an article in Christianity Today, a woman named Andrea Midget writes, when I think of the cross, I think of the outstretched arms of Jesus. And I hear him saying in Matthew's Gospel during the last week of his life, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those, that, who stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And Andrea continues, One night years ago in North Carolina, I went outside to check on some animals that were housed in my father's small farm. There was a full moon shining down in bright, brittle light above the pines. It was so cold that the water in the horse's trough had frozen over. And as I went to get an axe to chop through the ice, I noticed a chicken out in the yard. A hen perched near the trough through a perched near the trough with several chicks tucked under her wings. 
I was impressed with how she, she turned her face and her frail body of fluff right into the icy wind. Her wings outstretched, as it were, surely tired, protecting her children. And I was uplifted by what I took to be a gift and encouragement to my faith, this visual depiction of Jesus' care for me. But it struck me, Andrea writes, it struck me that those chicks had to come to the hymn. I don't know if she chased them around the yard first, if some came more willingly than others, or if some were still out there half frozen. I only know the chicks I could see had allowed themselves to be gathered up and protected. They quit fighting what they had no control over in the first place and said, you do it, Mom. And there's Jesus dying a slow and terrible death with his arms stretched wide for us. Dear friends, the cross is God's passionate invitation for us to come in from the cold, to come to him. He cares so much that he, he came to us and died for us. Listen to these promises from God's word. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. To those who receive him, to those who believe in his name, to them he gives the right to become children of God. When we see the cross, we see the depth of divine love. We peer into the compassionate heart of God in his love for you and for me. The cross tells us God cares. The second thing the cross tells us is that God understands our suffering. People often ask, you've probably asked, I certainly have, why does God allow suffering? Why doesn't God do something about the pain in this world? And the answer is, he has. Nobody can fully explain the pain and anguish that clouds our lives and spoils our world. The Bible teaches that at least some of our suffering is linked with human disobedience. We've closed our hearts to God. We've broken God's laws. And inevitably, when we go off track like that, there's a painful chaos that results. But I believe Christianity gives a more satisfying account of suffering than any other way of thinking or of living. Stoicism says, grin and bear it. Buddhism says it's all an illusion. Hinduism says it'll give you a better reincarnation. Islam says Allah allows people to suffer to test their patience and their loyalty. But only Christianity says God has not fully explained suffering, but he's come to share in it with us because God himself has experienced suffering. That's what we mean in the Apostles' Creed when we say Jesus descended into hell. We're talking now about the magnitude of what Jesus did for us on the cross. His body was destroyed in the worst possible way, but that was almost nothing compared to what happened to his soul. Because when he cried out in those words we read this morning in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was experiencing hell itself for you and for me. You know, the longer and deeper and more intimate the relationship, the more torturous is any separation. That's true for lovers. It's true for parents and their children. It's true for grandparents and their grandchildren. But think about the intimate relationship Jesus had with his Father. 
as the Son of God, Jesus' relationship with God the Father was eternal and deeper than we could ever imagine. Yet on the cross, God the Father and Jesus the Son were cut off from one another. Jesus went into the deepest pit, the most powerful furnace, and all this he did voluntarily for you and for me. Our Lord took upon himself the full consequences of our sinfulness, even the agony of abandonment, abandonment by God, in order that we might be spared. So the cross tells us that God understands our suffering because God himself has been there. Isn't that what we want most when we're suffering? Not a long lecture about the causes of our pain, some philosophical explanation, but somebody to come alongside us and take our hand. The cross shows us that God is like that. He is the suffering God who understands our suffering from the inside. And this leads us to the final thing I want to say about what the cross teaches us about God. Jesus' death on the cross tells us that he has paid our debts. That's the deepest thing the cross of Christ shows us. When Jesus died, he cried out, It is finished. It's over. The debt is paid. It's as if all our wrong thoughts and words and actions, all the flaws in our character, were one gigantic bill that we owed to a holy, righteous God. And because of God's holy, righteous character, God can't pretend that our sins don't matter, but God was so loving that he didn't want our sin to cut us off from him forever. So God acted. He allowed our guilt to crush him on the cross. He took our sin upon himself. Here's how Isaiah the prophet put it. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Listen to the Apostle Paul. In Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so we could be put right with God. Or listen to the Apostle Peter. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. Or listen to the writer from the book of Hebrews. Christ died once as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people and bring salvation to them. That's how the biblical writers describe what Jesus did on the cross. And because Jesus, the innocent one, took the guilt and judgment we deserved upon himself, anyone who puts their trust in him is accepted and forgiven by God. The cross is an assurance that if we turn to God in repentance and believing faith, we can be declared not guilty, forgiven for all our sins, and free to live in God's loving presence now and forever. God treats me just as if I'd never sinned. That's what justification means. When I put my trust in Christ, and what he did on the cross for me, God looks on me just as if I had never sinned. 
He sees Christ in me and Christ shed blood. And when we do sin and acknowledge it to God, God promises to forgive us. As David Watson once put it, the cross is where we find peace of mind, healing of relationships, forgiveness for ourselves, and strength to forgive others. It is God's power over all the forces of evil. All problems find their solution in Calvary. So brothers and sisters, the cross helps us understand what God is really like. God cares for us. God understands and enters into our suffering. And God has paid the debt that we owed to give us forgiveness and healing and eternal abundant life. What a gift. What a Savior. Amen. We praise you, O God, our Father, for making your truth real and personal to us in Jesus Christ and his cross. We pray now for the grace to believe what we have heard and to live in ways that honor you above all. Through Christ our Lord.
God, we offer you our praise, especially this day. We offer you our hearts. We offer you our money. We offer you our lives. Thank you for everything you give to us through the cross of Christ. Let's pray. In this holy week, as we remember Jesus' example of suffering for the cause of right, let us pray for the persecuted church. Uphold, O oh God, all those who are persecuted or imprisoned for their beliefs. Be to them a light showing the way ahead a rock giving them strength to stand, a song singing of things that have been overcome. As we remember the arbitrary justice and the brutal torture Jesus faced under Pontius Pilate, let us pray for the oppressed peoples around the world. Strong and merciful God, Stand with the oppressed against the triumph of evil and the complacency of your people and establish in Jesus Christ your new order of grace and justice, of generosity and joy, because he is alive and reigns now and forever. As we remember Jesus being betrayed, and deserted by his own disciples, by those close to him. Let us pray now for all people who are lonely. Lord Jesus, by the loneliness of your suffering on the cross, be near to all who feel desolate or in pain or isolated or sorrowful today. Let your presence transform their sorrow into comfort and their loneliness into fellowship with you for the sake of your tender mercy. As we recall the agony and grief of Jesus' crucifixion, let us pray for all who are near to death today and for their families. Dear Lord, keep watch. Keep watch with those who will be awake tonight or be weeping this night. And give your angels charge over all of us as we sleep. Tend to the sick. Give rest to the weary. Sustain the dying. Calm the suffering. Comfort the distressed. All for your love's sake, O Christ our Redeemer. As we remember the grief of Jesus' mother and those who stood with her as the sword of grief pierced her soul, let's pray for all those who are facing loss today. Lord Jesus, we ask you to be close to all those whose lives have been touched by sorrow. Give them courage to face their loss and comfort them with your unchanging love. Almighty God, who in your tender mercy towards the human race sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death on the cross, grant that we can follow his example of patience and humility, and also that we might be partakers of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Your friend standing at the foot of the cross as we are, as our Savior taught us, so we would pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. The insert now, the solemn reproaches of the cross. This is a version of an ancient text used by Christians around the world since the early days of the church, associated with the ending of the Good Friday service. The reproaches follows the pattern of Psalm 78, which rehearses God's continuing acts of faithfulness and Israel's repeated rebellion. Each reproach follows a similar pattern calling to mind God's saving actions and concluding with the same words, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. And following each reproach, we respond with a prayer for mercy. Would you stand with me as we read this together? As we pray this together. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I led you out of slavery into freedom and delivered you through the waters of rebirth, but you've made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, have mercy upon us. Forty years I led you through the desert, feeding you with men upon the way. I saved you from the time of trial and gave you my body, the bread of heaven but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, have mercy upon us. I led you on your way in a pillar of cloud and fire, but you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I guided you by the light of the Holy Spirit, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, have mercy upon us. I planted you as my fairest vineyard, but you brought forth bitter fruit. I made you branches of the vine and never left your side, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Have mercy, have mercy upon us. I poured out saving water from the rock, but you gave me vinegar to drink. I poured out my life and gave you the new covenant in my blood, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, have mercy upon us. I gave you a royal scepter, but you gave me a crown of thorns. I gave you the kingdom and crowned you with eternal life, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, have mercy upon us. I struck down your enemies, but you struck my head with a reed. I gave you peace, but you draw the sword in my name, and you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, have mercy upon us. I open the waters to lead you to the promised land, but you opened my side with the spear. I washed your feet as a sign of my love, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, have mercy upon us. I lifted you up to the heights, but you lifted me up high on the cross. I raised you from death and prepared for you the tree of life but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, have mercy upon us. I grafted you into my people Israel, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt, and you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, have mercy upon us. I was hungry and you gave me no food, thirsty and you gave me no drink, a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, have mercy upon us.
Thank you. 